Welcome to the Wild Physio Podcast with your host, Andrew Wild. Today, I'm super excited. I've got a huge guest on. We have Sohi Lee on, who is a cr- the creator of the Eat, Lift, Thrive movement. And Sohi, uh, Sohi has a master's in health psychology, is a writer, published author, online personal trainer, IFPA bikini pro, amateur powerlifter, and she's also a certified strength and conditioning specialist, certified sports nutritionist, <laughs> She's currently pursuing her PhD in sports science through the distance program at AUT, which is the Auckland University of Technology. A huge welcome to Sohi Lee, and that is a decent resume. Thank you. When you read it out like that, it sounds intimidating for me to even listen to, but I guess that's me. You deserve the props considering what you've done. Oh, like you, you've been consistent. You. You've been consistently yeah. learning for a good decade, haven't you? Yeah, at least. And professionally, nine years, but as a hobby for a little bit longer than that. But very cool to see all the stuff that I've done over the years and sure. am currently working on now. <laughs> how, how, how much longer do you have left with the PhD, do you think? I am about a year in. I think it'll be about two or three more years, which doesn't sound too bad because I know that some PhD students, you know, can take six, seven, eight years, depending on what they have going on in their life and so on. Um, but I would obviously prefer to get done in three to four years total. Sounds doable for me. Well, maybe like just less daunting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a, de- it's yeah. a decent, decent slog. Now, let's just dive straight into it. Now, I think one of the biggest things I wanted to talk about today was the psychology of dieting. And yes, one of the big factors in that is sustainable weight loss because I've obviously you've talked about it so much I talk about it if something isn't sustainable there's no point doing it and we need to find something that is sustainable long term why is sustainable weight loss and why is sustainable exercising important well um, depending on who you talk to people will say that people are generally speaking, you know, really good at losing the weight, but we're terrible at keeping the weight off. And I started thinking this around 10 years ago, actually, when I was having my own personal struggles with, with fat, with fat loss and um, not being able to sustain the results that I had, yo-yo dieting and so on. And I felt like I was trying really, really, really hard, but getting nowhere. And And I noticed that even though I felt like I was trying hard, exerting a lot of willpower and so on, my adherence was dropping, right? And obviously, when it gets to that point, it just feels discouraging. So it feels like you're putting in all this effort just to kind of go backwards or get nowhere. And so I started thinking, there has to be something I'm not getting right. There has to be something I'm misunderstanding or misapplying because I know what to do. I have the plan in front of me. Why can't I do it? Um, and that's when I started looking into the psychology of behavior change, the, the role that habits play. And I think when it comes to a big part of why so many people struggle with sustainable results is that they don't focus on their long term. They don't focus on their everyday health behaviors that will help them achieve and then subsequently maintain that weight loss over the long run. They're only thinking of how can I get to my end goal as fast as possible? right? And they're not thinking about how will it affect how I feel? How will it affect my quality of life? And those things absolutely matter. And it's so easy in the beginning for people to think, oh, I just want this to be really, really hard and fast. And I'll make whatever sacrifice needed to get to where I want to be. And they, they underestimate how difficult that that really is. So I think that's where people get messed up. Yeah, for sure. And I heard you say this in Melbourne a couple of years ago, the psychology of dieting is nearly more important than the physiology. And you would argue that it definitely is. Now, you already mentioned habits. And I often say this to my clients, we need to rely on habits rather than motivation. Why is that? Why is that? Because motivation is unreliable. Motivation is fleeting right? And it's, it's very, very normal to feel high levels of motivation at the beginning of your journey of whatever goal you have. So let's just use your resolutions as an example for everyone says, you know, let's say someone says, ah, I'm going to lose 
10 kilos this year and January 1st is when I start and I'm going to hit the gym six days a week, do two hours of cardio a day. And here's my eight item food list. I'm going to eat 800 calories and so on and so forth. And in their head, because as I'm sitting here thinking about what I want to do, I'm well fed, right? I'm not dieting. I have good energy. I'm well rested. I'm in a good mood. And so when we are in what's called a cold state, this is in like psychology, we have this, there's a gap where we uh, are unable to empathize with our future selves in a hot state. So a hot state refers to when you're tired, cranky, fatigued, you know, low energy, all those things. So because I'm currently in a, I'm actually doing okay right now, it's really hard for me to think, oh, but there's going to be a time in the future when I don't feel exactly as I do now. And when I do feel tired and hungry and so on, it's going to be that much harder to do what I have planned out with all these extreme behaviors that I've set for myself. So that happens all the time, as well as uh, self-control is also another one, right? Self-control is, I feel like it's very much misapplied. So self-control and willpower, which are, I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably, are not bad, obviously. They can be very, very useful, but I think that their utility should more be in creating habits that serve you rather than utilizing that self-control to do hard things every single day. So you should be a lot smarter and more strategic about how you apply that self-control. And also when it comes to setting behavior goals and so on, set behaviors that rely on low models, uh, low levels of motivation. That way, even on your worst day, you're still willing to do the thing. That way you can build consistency and you build success momentum and then you can actually make progress that way. Yeah, for sure. And that's so well answered because I think also the, the habits that you have, if they're quote unquote a bad habit, they need to be replaced with another habit. That is really important yeah. as well. Would you say? Yes. So something like, you know, a lot of people would say when they're tired and stressed or something like that, they would go to, you know, a whole block of chocolate. And that is a really good coping mechanism that people use. But then right. if we try and replace it with, okay, when you're tired and stressed, let's go for a walk or yes. let's go kick the football or the soccer ball down at the park with your kids or something like that. Then you've changed that mindset a little bit and they're relying on the habits rather than being like, oh no, the chocolate's in the cupboard. I can control myself today. Well, at least if you go for uh, that habit. Yeah. And I hate that as well. When you hear that from PTs and anyone, they say, just try harder. And I've heard you talk about this as well. Uh, the, yeah, the, the, the whole, the whole just try harder is so frustrating because a lot of the people that are saying this are people that have never struggled. Right. For them, it's easy for they, so it's hard for them to empathize with people for whom it is difficult. Exactly. They're like, it's easy for me. And I'm like, that doesn't help anyone. Yeah. yeah. Completely agree. And this has come from someone that's never struggled with weight loss. I've always been able to maintain my weight or manipulate things pretty easily, even before I um, you know, knew a lot about nutrition and strength conditioning, even when I was younger. So I've had to really change my thinking because everything's been quite easy for me. So in listening right. to people like you that are you know, experts in the field of psychology and everything has made everything so much easier for me, for sure. Yeah. Um, now on this as well, so here, a lot of people, I, I feel like they think that, you know, building a habit will take a few weeks. How long do you think it would take in terms of building a, like a really decent habit? Cause you look at some of the yeah. research and it's roughly like 66 days, they say to yes. build that, that, that habit. And the idea of it is to get sort of nailed down into the basal ganglia in your brain. What are your thoughts on the numbers of building that habit? Well, yeah, so that is based off a 2010 study by Lally and colleagues, um, and um, they looked at a bunch of health behaviors, and so while obviously they didn't look at every single behavior, but they just tracked how long, so they had, I think it was college students, they, choo they chose a certain health behavior that they wanted to work on that they didn't currently have, and they said, okay, this has to be something that you are going to do every day. And then every day you log onto the site and you fill out this uh, habit index and then we'll assess the habit strength of that behavior over time. And then they obviously track the progression and so on. And that's how they came up 
with the conclusion that, oh, it takes an average of 66 days. But it obviously depends on how complex the behavior is, right? Because some behaviors are going to require more steps than others, for example, or are maybe more difficult to do than others. Uh, it depends on how frequently you're performing it. There are a lot of different factors that go into how quickly a habit can form. But the good news is that missing your habit, like missing, do, missing your, ha your behavior for one day does not negatively affect the habit formation process. So actually that's, I find that very encouraging from people who maybe struggle with some of the all or nothing mentality where they're like, well, if I miss one day, everything's ruined. Well, we can say, actually you miss one day, you're totally fine. Just tomorrow, get right back on track, right? Just make your next meal better. You know, things, things like that can absolutely help. So I find that I, I would say give it a few weeks and I've, I've personally never obsessed over how long it takes for a behavior to become a habit because the way you measure a habit is really how automatic is it in your mind now, right? Mm. How much cognitive energy does it take? And when it takes little to no cognitive energy, that's when you can say it's become a habit. And then from within the habit realm, habit can be weak or it can be strong. So there's that whole range also. So it's hard to, it's not like, oh, like, you know, today, this was just a regular behavior and tomorrow it's a habit. It's not like that. There's a whole range. Um, with that said, I would say, yeah, give it a few weeks. I like to tell people average is 66 days, but it could be honestly, depending on what it is, it could be instant habit formation could be instant or it could take, uh, I think one of the longest was like 254 or 264 days for a behavior to come ahead to become a habit according to that same study. So it can take months, right? So, and I say, I don't worry about that. Don't worry about the time. Just focusing on, just focus on doing the thing every day. That's it. Yeah, completely and, agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, really well answered. And I think something that, you know, could be done really quickly is something so simple as if someone binges a lot on say, a tub of ice cream, rather than having that tub of ice cream in the freezer, never have a tub of ice cream there. So you have to go to the shop and get yes. an ice cream because yes. I think there was that study um, done on where they had different types of drinks and they put the drinks at the back of the fridge versus the front of the fridge. Th and that the is the, um, what was the that choice study? architecture, choice architecture intervention by Anne Thorndike in uh, maybe 2011 or yes. so. Yes. So it was one. like a Boston yep. hospital. Exactly. They placed water either easily yep. accessible or even just behind some soda cans and even moving it behind there was enough for people to be like, yeah, this is not worth it for me to grab. So basically what they were doing was en engineering their environment to design for laziness, to exactly. make the target behavior the easier thing to do. So when you make water consumption in that study, water consumption and also decreasing soda consumption, you just make the soda hard to access, a little bit hard to access, and the water more readily available, your water intake goes up without relying on willpower. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that study. I've, I've heard you talk about it before. I had a yeah. bit of a cruise of it as well. It's quite interesting because, you know, every human on earth is going to be inherently lazy to a point, but it's not necessarily lazy. It's it's the matter of, oh, we're just trying to conserve energy. I think you really... The, you, the default is to do the easier thing. Exactly. Like we're doing yeah. the easy thing to conserve energy really at the end of the day. Right. And that's more of an evolutionary thing, which makes yeah. sense, which makes complete sense. Right, so sense. let's try and make that work in your favor. Yeah, for sure. And that's yeah. exactly what I meant with that whole get rid of the tub in your, um, in your freezer yes. in terms of the ice right. cream. You have to go to the shop to get it. You might, only, right. you might be only doing that twice a week because you can't be bothered for the other five nights of the week getting in the car or walking to the shop or whatever it is. Right, right, for sure. absolutely. All right, next topic. The difference between weight loss and fat yeah. loss. I think this is okay. a big one. And I, I think you sort of, you touched on it before, people thinking that they should lose or they try and lose weight really, really quickly. Yeah. And, you know, they're put on weight maybe in a space of 10 years. They're put on 10 to 15 kilos and then they've got this notion that they need to lose that weight in, you know, two to three months rather than thinking, oh, I've put it on slowly over 10 years. Maybe I should do it slowly as well in terms of losing it. What's the difference between weight and fat loss? What are some of the other things you can do to achieve the fat loss rather than just the weight loss as well. Yeah. Well, this is why, okay. So first of all, I think it's very, very common for people to use those terms interchangeably, right? When they say, Oh, I want to lose 20 pounds. What they're really meaning is 20 pounds of body fat. 
um, whether or not they realize it. However, this is a part of why I don't really like relying solely on scale weight to measure fat loss progress because all, you're not measuring your fat loss, you're measuring your weight loss when you're doing that. And weight loss can refer to anything on your body that you know takes up mass, right? So it could be referring to water weight, it could be referring to your organs, can be referring to your muscle mass, can be referring to, oh, did you cut off a limb? Then obviously you will now weigh less. So you technically you have achieved weight loss, uh, but you haven't achieved fat loss. So strictly fat loss is obviously re referring only to fat mass that you carry. So when people want to want to lose weight, I have yet to come across anyone who actually means, oh, but I also want to lose several pounds of muscle and water and fat. It's usually, I just want to lose body fat. So when you do that, you want to, to achieve fat loss, as much fat loss as possible. Um, you want to, a couple of things you can do. Uh, one is to consume sufficient protein. I recommend either one gram per pound of lean body mass of your current lean body mass. However, most people don't know how to calculate this or they don't know their body fat percentage accurately. So they don't, then they can't, you know, give a good estimate of that. So I'm like, okay, never mind. If that's the case, then um, I recommend uh, 0.73 grams per pound of total current body weight, which I forget what the kilo translation is, but I think it's like, is it 0.6 something or 0.5 something? Yeah, it's, it, are these off Alan's recommendations? The one no, this point, is off Stu Phillips' uh, ah, systematic right. review. Yeah, so uh, his systematic review. Yeah, I, I work along in terms of the metric system: one point five to one point six, up to two point two times your body weight. I think that sounds right. Yeah, in kilos, and that's for right. people trying to optimize body composition. But then right. the elderly um, people that aren't lifting that sort of stuff, it's normally sort of that one point two to one point six ish um, per kilo. Yeah. yeah. So that would be the minimum. <clears throat> and yes. then anything like I, I like to set a minimum and I work primarily with the female population. And what I found is that not all of them, but the majority of them have are under eating protein. So if they're already, let's say they're con currently consuming 40 grams of protein, I'm not going to say, okay, starting tomorrow, you're going to have 120 grams a day. It from again from a behavior change standpoint, it's a lot more. They'll see a lot more success if they first start off with sixty grams for the first two weeks, and then they you know maybe bump up by twenty grams every two weeks, something like that, something more gradual and doable. So anyway, that's going to help retain your lean body mass, your your muscle mass while you die down. Um, in conjunction with that, you should be strength training, and not just any kind of strength training. I recommend um, a high effort resistance training program that has an emphasis on progressive overload. So even though you are dieting down, you want to be pushing in the gym as though you are trying to gain muscle mass because what is going to help um, gain the muscle mass is also what helps you retain it while you're dieting down. So you, I, for me anyway, when I have my clients, whether they're gaining muscle mass or dieting down, the training program itself, the, the, the approach stays the same. It's not like, okay, we're doing fat loss. Now we're doing fast paced circuits with little rest and really, really lightweight. It doesn't, it does not change. The only thing that really changes is primarily their nutrition. <clears throat> so those two things. Uh, third thing you can do is to create a more modest calorie deficit. So um, if you go too aggressive, you do put yourself at greater risk of losing more muscle mass while you diet down. And it's especially true for people who are already lean. So if you are, if your body fat puts you in the obese category, for example, you have more wiggle room as far as how aggressive you can take that calorie deficit and still be muscle sparing. And then the last thing is managing your sleep and stress. Because even if you, everything else being equal, if you're getting nine hours, and there's a study on this, nine hours of sleep versus five hours of sleep a night, you are going to lose more muscle mass getting five hours of sleep a night. Um, so those... I don't know, was that four or five things? Those <laughs> things are the ones that I would, I would recommend as far as um, optimizing fat loss results. Yeah, beautifully answered. Now, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think a lot of people think that the, if they just lose weight, they're just going to automatically lose a lot of fat. Um, right. While we're on this topic as well, I wasn't going to delve into this, but you've talked about it a bit and I have over the years as well, but recomping, 
Yeah. So let's just dive into what body recomposition is, why it's a great option for a lot of people, why it's a slow mm -hmm. process and yeah. why you're doing it at the moment, because I think you are, I think you've mentioned that you're really happy at your body weight and you're just going to yeah. continue to stay at this body weight and just keep getting stronger and then go from there. Yeah. To be honest, I'm, I'm at the same. I'm just trying to get stronger, maintaining body weight. And a lot of the women that I coach, especially, um, you know, the girls training classes I have, you know, I get them to try and find a weight that they're reasonably comfortable at, they're close, they're feeling confident, and then from there, just get them stronger and then maintain yeah. a reasonably high-protein diet. So let's just exactly. dive into a bit of recomp. <clears throat> okay, so body recomposition or recomp, which is what most people call it, refers to the process where you simultaneously gain muscle and shed body fat. Uh, and these things happen at the same time. Now, most people who have physique goals want some degree of recomp to happen. Um, and the good news, there has actually been a new review paper that just came out, I think, one or two months ago that summarized, like, you know, all the research on body recomposition. And while we traditionally have thought that body recomposition was really only possible in um, people who with obesity, beginner trainees, people coming back from a long training hiatus, so a long time off from lifting weights, and then people on steroids. So these were the four categories in which people are like, okay, you guys can recomp. Now we're actually finding that even more seasoned train lifters, such as you and I, can see recomp changes, uh, except it's just a little bit slower of a process. Uh, regardless, you can see it. Interestingly, you can recomp when you're in a deficit, energy, energy deficit. You can recomp at maintenance. You can even recomp in a surplus when that surplus is coming from an increased protein intake, which I found very, very interesting. So basically what we're finding is that recomp is possible for like all populations. And what you need to do for, for that is that that is going to come primarily from your training. That is the primary stimulus for gaining muscle mass. And I would recommend for most people to eat at roughly maintenance calories-ish. Um, and if you're really trying to recomp, um, keep a rough eye on scale weight maybe take your waist measurement, waist circumference measurement every two to four weeks, uh, take progress pictures that could be helpful. And th this is the thing that most people overlook too. Track your progress in the gym over time. Because yes. if you are getting stronger while maintaining roughly the same body weight and your waist measurement is going down, that is a really good indicator that you are successfully recomping. But also instead of tracking obsessing over week to week changes, try to think more long term because recomp take it, takes months and months and months and maybe even a couple of years to see meaningful change to happen. So that is recomping and it can, it's, it's a fun process. I would I say fun. It can be a fun process, but you have to be patient. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree. And I, I think yeah. One thing you said there that's really important is photos. Like they're so, yeah. so useful. You know, if you take a photo now and then do another photo in 12 months time and you compare the two and you've just stayed at the same body weight, yes. but you've gotten stronger and you've added 20 kilos to every lift, of course you'll probably look better. Yeah. So like yeah. I even look at it myself, like I'm especially upper body stuff at the moment, I'm probably stronger than I had been for a very long time. And I compare myself to maybe three years ago and yeah, I probably look better and I'm definitely yeah. stronger. Um, have I right. really, you know, I haven't really gone up and down in terms of body weight at all. I've kind of just stayed the same, but just kind of just got stronger. So I think it's a really, really effective way of going about it, especially with women. So they don't yo-yo and they're not sort of going up and down in terms of scale weight right, all the time. Right. I think it's really yeah. important and you would agree with that. Yeah. And like, you know, don't get me wrong. If that's what you genuinely want to do, or if you don't mind those weight fluctuations, that is totally okay. Yeah, for sure. But if you find, yeah, but if you find that you experience some psychological distress, when that happens, which also is completely valid, it's nice to know you don't have to do drastic cut and bulk cycles. Now, with that said, if you did want to gain muscle faster than the recomping route, you would see a faster rate of muscle gain when you put yourself in a in more of an actual calorie surplus. Um, with that said, you that means you are going to gain some degree of body fat with the muscle mass as well. And most people don't want that to happen or they want to keep the fat gain to a minimum. So if you, if that is the case, then the trade-off would be slightly slower rate of muscle gain, 
in exchange for mitigating the fat gain or shedding body fat. Yeah, completely. That's where recomp comes in. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Now, in terms of women's strength training, I think this is a big one. And you see so many instant Insta influencers online doing these crazy workouts. And it's like, oh, I'm doing my, I'm doing my, <laughs> my delt workout for the day and I'm doing my glute workout for the day. What exercises should women be doing? Because I'm a massive proponent of doing the compound movements, getting stronger over yes. time, getting oh, really good I at chin-ups, have... push-ups, Absolutely. all these type of movements. What exercises do you really push all your women trainees to do? Um, and also while we're on that topic, why should you not do combination exercises? What I mean by that is doing a, bi <laughs> <laughs> doing a bicep curl with yeah. a shoulder press or doing a split squat with a bicep curl or something stupid like, like that. Why should you not do that? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you know how I feel about these, right? <laughs> okay. So a lot of, a lot of, this is what I call swipe workouts that you see on Instagram where you is like, oh my God, here's a workout for you. Swipe to see all the exercises and they're, they're fine, right? They're harmless in and of itself. I think they can be helpful if the user, if the consumer knows how to use the workouts responsibly. And what I mean by that, and I, I ha I'm gonna have a post uh, lined up for this topic. What I mean by that is don't just go to your favorite influencers page and pick a random workout every day. It's not like um, for 30 days, I'm gonna do 25 different workouts depending on what looks fun and I like her outfit in this video and that <laughs> exercise looks cool, I wanna try it out. If your goal is simply to have fun with your workouts and that's it, that's totally fine, right? That you're having fun, you're getting some movement in, definitely better than nothing, have at it. But if you wanna get serious about seeing results, that's not the way to go about things. What you can do is pick a swipe workout a well-designed one, and that's a whole nother topic, a well-designed <laughs> swipe, swipe workout. Let's say, let's say you want to do a body part split, right? It's like, oh my God, this is a shoulders and arms day. This is a whatever, legs day, glutes day, and so on. You pick one of each, lay it out for your week. Let's say you have four or five workouts for the week and repeat those same workouts every week for, I would recommend four to eight weeks. And what you want to do is next week you come back, you do the same workout, you're going to add a rep or you're going to add five pounds or, you know, increase the load, increase the range of motion, improve your form, progressively overload in some way, shape or form and keep doing that week after week after week. That is how you can use those swipe workouts to your benefit and have them. But I don't know anyone who actually does that. Yeah. Honestly, because it's, it, Instagram and social media is not set up for that kind of approach. And it makes it really hard for, to encourage people to actually follow structured training programs which is better for seeing results, right? And as far as um, combination exercises go, I've done several posts on this before and um, I don't dislike them outright. I think that the majority of combination exercises are poorly designed, right? So the example that you used for, uh, for example, a bicep curl to press, uh, usually you're going to be limited in load by what you can do for the bicep curl, where you, you know, I can like maybe curl maybe 20s, 20 pounds in each hand, but I can press like 35s, right? So it's like, okay, I'm not getting enough stimulus for the shoulder press, but I am for the bicep curl. Why don't I just separate the two exercises? Um, with that said, you can, there are some exercises that you can do well. For example, if they transition well from one to the other and the load that you would use for both exercises is relatively similar, then that would make for a decent combination of exercise. For example, if you did a reverse lunge to a uh, B stance or split stance Romanian deadlift, you yeah. could do that, right? Um, and you know, in that regard, you can say it is more efficient. But by and large, I like to keep my exercises separate, or I can superset them where I do one exercise, then you do the you know however many reps of one set, and then you do one set of another exercise. And again, those have to be intelligently designed as well. But when you're doing that exercise, if you're doing that superset where it's a split, you're not using the same weight probably that you use for that first no, exercise. You, typically and not, right. Exactly. And I've had to fight this a lot over the years with clients. But even recently, I don't know whether you saw the footage of Hulk, the Brazilian footballer. Did you? Oh, he was doing... So no. I'm talking... He's one of the most physically impressive 
soccer players or footballers that I've ever seen. I actually saw him in person. He was in Sydney here recently. And he's a beast. Like, he's a really big guy. Yeah. And on Instagram, he was doing a... It was a bicep curl into a Bulgarian split squat. And then... Yeah, I know. I know. (laughs) And then he was doing... (laughs) He was doing a lateral raise into a bicep curl, which I didn't hate necessarily. I think it was, but anyway, he was doing the he was doing the split like these split combination exercises, and people are going to look at how jacked he is and be like, "Oh, I should be doing that." Yeah. This is the yeah. real trouble with it is there's so many jacked yeah. people out there that are just genetically gifted, or right. But I think genetics is such a big thing, and maybe we should delve into that yes, a little bit. Yes, it is. Let's do that, actually. Why don't we just segue into that? So genetics, I think a lot of people go online and they look at what people are doing on their Instagram and they see this person with this perfect body and they think they want to they want to achieve that. But the reality is they've won the genetic lottery. Yes, they're yes. probably trained hard and they obviously probably eat really well as well. But why should people realize that genetics matter? This is the part that a lot of people don't like to talk about. People don't <laughs> like to attribute their success to, I was just born this way. They like to say, uh, well, because I work harder than all of you guys. And I'm like, eh. I mean, maybe to a degree, but also you have good genetics is a big part of it. And genetics can be the difference between like, you know, if two people put in the same amount of effort and follow the exact same program for the same number of years, they can get wildly different results. And that is because of genetics. Someone, some people have um, a better genetic predisposition to getting more muscle mass, or some people have a gen- genetic predisposition to be leaner because maybe their uh, levels of non-exercise activity thermogenesis are high, naturally higher throughout the day. Mine's pretty low, actually. Um, or And or they naturally have a smaller appetite. They don't get as hungry. And this is a real thing where uh, many people who struggle with their weight have inherently higher levels of hunger. And thus, it is a lot harder for them to put themselves in a consistent calorie deficit, for example, right? And um, can definitely be the difference. So when you see someone online who is a celebrity or someone with a big following or someone who has the body that you've always dreamed of and you see what they're doing, it is, it is human nature to attribute whatever they're showing on their feed to, oh, this is what's helping them be successful. But it may be the case that actually they're seeing the results perhaps in spite of what they're doing right? Not, not necessarily because of it. And it could be, it might be that they just have the genetics to look a certain way without necessarily having to do all the right things per se. Mm. Yeah, it is huge. Because one thing on that as well. So with, I don't know what the study was, but I'm pretty sure I read one where the people that are overweight or obese gain a lot more pleasure from food than people that are leaner and quote unquote at a normal body weight. Yeah. And this is coming from someone that like, I definitely don't get a crazy amount of pleasure from food. Like I don't get me wrong. I like food and I eat a lot of food, but it's not like I crave food all the time. Right. Do you know I'm the what same I mean? way. Yeah. yeah. Like I can eat a meal and once I'm satiated, I probably won't go. I'll go like five, six hours without even thinking about food again. Yeah. I'm fine. Exactly. Yeah. But then yeah. there's other things in life that I would crave. Like I, you know, right. I, I'm always often thinking about a sport or something like that or golf yeah. or something like that. Yeah, and yeah. Like I get more pleasure out of, you know, hitting that perfect shot of golf Those or something things. like that rather than, right. rather than the food. And I think that's important for people to understand because a lot of people that are super lean and in that genetic elite often just don't get a lot of, I suppose, reward from eating. Yeah. per se. Yeah. And some people would be different than others. But at the same time, for someone like myself that stayed at a decent body weight for his whole life, like I don't really get that much pleasure. Sounds like right. you don't either. And that's why, that's why for people like you, it's, I think the default is to just assume that because something you experience something a certain way, you assume everyone else does as well. Exactly. Right? And yes. that's why I'm like, you know, I almost feel like being genetically i put this in quotes being genetically blessed whatever that means to the individual i almost feel like being genetically blessed almost puts you at a disadvantage when it comes to actually helping other people because you either have to um you have to make an effort to empathize 
and understand that other people struggle a lot more than you do. And it's not always because they're not trying hard enough. And most of the time that's not, that's not it at all. Oftentimes they are trying harder than you, Yeah. but life circumstances and so on just make things so much more difficult for them relative to you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And personally, I'm one of these people that can't sit still, you know, my non-exercise activity is just always off the charts because obviously I'm on my feet all day as well because of what I do, but still I'm a massive fidgeter, you know, I'm sitting down moving all the time. And for the listeners out there, yeah, NEAT is your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is effectively the calories you burn from anything that's not structured, sleeping, eating or um, exercise. Yeah. So it's fidgeting know walk into the bus blah 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 so um yeah for sure now so he one more question about this sort of psychology stuff about dieting now this one's a big one people under reporting their intake Uh, yes yeah Yeah. it's the biggest yes absolutely and, and and over reporting their exercise because there yeah. was one oh, study, yeah. there was one study in I think it was ninety two that they ha- uh, they brought out where people that were overweight or obese underreported their calorie intake by up to fifty percent. It was close to fifty percent, and they overreported their exercise by up to fifty yeah. percent. And I think there was right. another one done with dietitians, and they um, found that they overreported. Sorry, they underreported their caloric intake by up to two hundred to three hundred calories. And then non dietitians underreported by 400 to 500 calories. Yes. So let's dive into that. Yeah. Why is this such a big thing? Underreporting is probably the most common mistake that people make when they are either actively pursuing fat loss or when they're not necessarily trying to, but they find themselves slowly gaining weight over the course of several years. They're like, oh my God, my eating hasn't even changed. Why am I putting on weight? Well, it's because you're eating more than you realize every day. And when it comes to under, yeah, for dieting, for sure, people, it's very easy, common for people to say, oh, I've hit a plateau or I have metabolic damage or I have a slow metabolism or something like that. When in reality, they're simply eating far more than they realize. And um, sometimes this is intentional. Sometimes people intentionally lie about how much they eat, oftentimes due to shame. For example, if they're struggling with binge eating and they're eating you know, a whole jar of peanut butter every night, they may not necessarily want to mention that to you. Or um, a lot of it as well could be unintentional where they legitimately forget that they have eight cups of coffee and in every cup of coffee, they put a bunch of creamer into it, right? Or they forget the handful of chocolates that they had in the middle of the afternoon. They forget to track the oils that they put when they cook and the butters and sauces, which is very, very common. Um, Or they rely on volume measurements. So they're using a half cup rather than measuring out 40 grams of oats. They're doing like a heaping, you know, half cup of oats, which could be 50% or more than what they're supposed to, you know, more than the 40 grams that they think. Stuff like that absolutely contributes to it. And I think the study you mentioned uh, or maybe there, there were a number of studies looking at this, but they, and uh, several studies, they were very similar. They recruited women who have reported to be dieting and reported themselves as being unsuccessful, even though they're supposedly consuming few calories. So they were like, okay, if you think you're eating around like 1300 calories a day or fewer, and you're not seeing any fat loss progress, we'd like to recruit you for the study. And what they found was that they interviewed these people before, uh, And one woman in particular had reported, she herself said she had tried, she had made hundreds of dieting attempts throughout her life, hundreds. She was the one who was under-reporting by, I think, around 2,000 calories a day. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Right. And I don't think she's outside the norm at all, at all. Um, So... This is a big part of why I've become so much more skeptical over the years of people's reported dietary intake and people's reported dietary adherence. They're like, yes, I'm sticking to the plan. I'm like, well, you haven't seen the progress. So I know there's something else going on here. So I start asking more probing questions. What are you drinking? Because some people don't realize, hey, that cocktail has a lot of calories, right? Or that fruit juice actually counts still. What are you drinking? Are you using a food measurement? Are you taking bite, licks, and taste throughout the day? 
Is there, you know, stuff like that. All of it, all these questions can get to the bottom of how could, how are they underreporting? And, um, you know, with, with this too, I try to be very careful with my wording as well, because you don't want to encourage obsession. You just want to encourage awareness. And there is a big difference between being mindful and aware of something versus being full on obsessed. And we don't want to get into the obsession category. Um, you don't want to go down that road. But underreporting is huge. And in fact, women who have a higher BMI are more prone to underreporting, as well as individuals with, um, who have had more dieting attempts in the past. And the longer you've been dieting, like let's say you're on a certain dieting stint for several months, the longer you've been dieting, the more likely it is that your adherence is going to drop over time. So even though maybe your target calories remain the same, maybe your actual intake slowly creeps up because you start to feel worn down, you know, you get hungry, you cave in, and so on and so forth. So very, very big, very, very common phenomenon. And I like talking about it because I'm hoping that by inc one, one, increasing awareness of it, and two, hopefully normalizing it by saying, hey, this is actually really common. You don't have to be ashamed about it. Almost almost everyone does it, even dietitians who basically should know how to do these things for a living. They still under report by over 200 calories a day. And when they, when some people hear that, they might be like, oh shit. Okay. Well then maybe I don't feel so bad telling my coach actually at night, this is what I struggle with. And I don't tell anyone about this, but this is happening. Right. So that's why, yeah. Under reporting is huge. A lot of people forget the alcohol calories as well. <laughs> And this yeah. is, this is huge. You know, is someone, imagine someone that's a woman, 55 kilos, she goes out and has four cocktails and the cocktails are 400 calories each, which is, you know, within the realm of the norm. Yeah. Like a lot of cocktails yeah. are really, really high calorie. You know, you yeah. go out and have four cocktails of 400 calories, there's 1600 calories straight up. And, you know, a lot of people don't factor those in and they pretend yeah. that they didn't have that, those cocktails or they they think they had two when they had five. You know what I mean? So, and this is another like mini topic in itself. So he, people having big weekends and ruining all of that hard work they've done from Monday through Friday. <laughs> oh, and then yeah. they kind of go into this fuck it mode where they're like, nah, I ruined my weekend. I ruined my week of dieting. You know what, Sunday, I'm hungover. I'm just going to blow out as well. Just dive into that quickly as well because I often talk about it, you know, it's like a budget, you know, either side of that day, even if you've had a bit of yeah. a blowout, you can reduce your calories whilst maintaining a reasonably high protein diet, either side of that to kind of get back on track because weekly, yeah. trump, weekly calories trump daily calories. So yeah. w why is this really important? Because I see it all the time, you know, people coming in and they're like, oh, I'm not seeing any progress. I'm like, what happened on the weekend? And they say that all the time. I had a blowout. I had a big weekend. Why is it so important that people understand that these weekend calories that they're consuming count? Well, the, the real reason is it's extremely easy to eat thousands and thousands and thousands of calories, especially when you're eating things like cheesy pizza, greasy, this burgers, this and that, French fries, the calories add up surprisingly quickly. And it is very, very common for your weekend eating to wipe out any calorie deficit you've worked to achieve throughout the week. And this is an example of the all or nothing mentality or the not all or nothing approach in action. And um, part of it can be that perhaps your actual plan is so restrictive either in food choice and or in calories that by the time friday rolls around you feel so deprived that you just cave and when you cave what happens is something called counter regulatory eating in the scientific literature also known as the what the hell effect meaning ah oh, what the hell i've strayed from my plan might as well go hard and i'll start again on monday this is counter regulatory eating happens all the time. Or some people plan it out, right? They're like, oh, intentionally, I'm going to go really strict during so Monday to Friday. And then Saturday, Sunday, I'm going to give myself these cheat days. And I put this in quotes because I hate that term. And I think it's actually very harmful. Uh, but that's what people call it, cheat days. And so to them, in their minds, they have license to eat anything 
they want and how, however much quantities they want. And maybe they were told by some person or another that it actually helps them in their fat loss efforts. And this gets abused to where, like I used to do this, I would easily consume four or 5,000 calories in a day over the weekend when I used this approach. But when I, if, if I had actually sat down and done the math on, okay, I'm having two 4,500 calorie days as an example, and then five, I don't know, 1,400 calorie days, what does the math actually average out to? Oh my God, I'm actually in a calorie surplus, you know? That can absolutely happen. So what I like doing, because it's very normal to want to eat more on the weekends. It's part of everyone's, a lot of people's lifestyle. And, and again, from a behavior change standpoint, to me, it does not make sense to say, all right, we're going to you treat your weekends the exact same as you do during the week. Your eating is going to be the same no matter what. Make these sacrifices, drastic sacrifices to your life. I don't like that because you're requiring too much change and it's going, it can negatively affect people's quality of life. And if they're not enjoying their diet, if they feel, the more deprived you feel, the more likely to you, you are to stray, right? And again, this goes back to sustainable fat loss. So what I can do is, okay, let's compromise. I'm not going to uh, encourage the all or nothing approach, but instead of your calories way down here during the week and then way up here over the weekend, let's bring it in on either side a little bit. So I'm going to increase your week, weekday calories by a little bit. So by the time Friday rolls around, you don't feel so shitty. And then over the weekend, I will give you a higher, higher calorie allotment, but not to the point where you erase all your progress. So that is my compromise. I call this the weekday diet. And Bill Campbell actually did a research study on it that was just published, I think just this year or maybe last year. And they found that it was effective for eliciting fat loss results. And if, I, if I'm recalling correctly, the people who use this approach actually saw better lean body mass retention um, using this approach because they had a form of like a diet break sort of form over the weekends. Um, so while it's good for psychological purposes, it looks like there are some physiological benefits of this approach as well. So that could work. I do this with about 80 to 90% of my fat loss clients, I would say, the weekday diet, uh, where, and then there are some people who actually genuinely prefer to have a more linear calorie approach, which is fine as well. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah. Great segue yeah. as well. You brought up diet breaks. Yeah. <laughs> Let's jump into that just briefly for that last question about dieting. So what is a diet break? Why would you use it? And how often do you use a diet break? Diet breaks are literally taking a break from your diet, but they're typically strategic. It's not like, oops, I binged on chocolate. Oh, this is my diet break. Which by the way, I used to tell myself back in the day, I used to say, oh, this is a refeed. I'm like, no, you're just binging on a whole plate of cookies. Um, so I would try to justify to reduce the cognitive dissonance of experiencing. Um, anyway, a diet break. Uh, typically what you wanna do is you bring up your calories to at least maintenance levels or higher for a number of days. Now, the most common way that I do it is usually weekends, so like two or three days, depending on how long you want your weekend to be, two or three days, and then you go back into a deficit during the weekday. Um, or you can do you know, like one week on, one week off. You can do two weeks on, two weeks off. Um, from a lifestyle standpoint, you can also plan your diet breaks around when you're going on vacation or when you're traveling. I've done this very successfully with my clients and it, again, works very well from a lifestyle and adherence standpoint. So if you're going to Vegas for a weekend, of course, I'm going to give you, you want to have more wiggle room to have a good time, right? Um, so that's very, very normal. So the misconception with diet breaks is, oh, if I, diet, if I take a diet break, I'm going to backtrack in my progress. And it's actually the opposite. Diet breaks are very good for long-term progress. Because not only are you getting that psychological break of getting more food and feeling better, more energy, um, satisfy your cravings and so on. Um, but again, the research consistently shows it is better from an RMR, resting metabolic rate retention standpoint, as well as lean body mass retention standpoint. Um, so there's no downside to taking a diet break. And I would recommend probably taking more diet breaks in people who have lower body fat. So maybe for a male who's roughly 10% body fat or less, or for a female who's 20% body fat or less, might be might behoove you to do more frequent diet breaks. 
Um, but anyone, anyone can do them. But again, I do recommend being strategic about them. So I can either actually do them. I do one of two ways. One is I might plan them out ahead of time for a client, depending on what their lifestyle is, or they're like, Oh, I have this plan, this vacation, this trip. I'm like, okay, so we're going to diet through here. Then for those dates, we'll take a diet break and I'll bring you up to a roughly maintenance, sometimes maybe more so on. And then we'll go back to dieting and so on. So you can do it that way. The other way is to, um, just, I might do like, uh, the weekday diet approach where I do lower calories during the week, roughly maintenance or slightly below over the weekend or something like that. And I just do like mini, mini diet breaks like this. And then, but then when I, when they start to say, Hey, I'm start, I'm starting to feel a little bit fatigued. Um, I'm noticing my hunger levels are increasing. I'm starting to think about food more. Those are what I consider to be red flags with dieting. So when I start to notice them popping up, I'm saying, okay, Hey, let's take a diet break. Let's take an extended diet break for at least one month. So I'll say, let's do it for one month. See how you feel at the end of the month. If you still feel this way, maybe you're, will increase your calories a little bit more. Let's do two months. Let's do three months. And then whenever you feel solid again, and let's say you still want to pursue fat loss, then we can go back into diet mode. So those are the two ways that I like to do it. Yeah, completely agree. And <clears throat> third for thought, excuse the pun, for women is a diet break during the end of the luteal phase probably isn't the greatest yes. idea. I can't believe you I know, forgot to mention that. Yes. So, you know, when you're in that PMS week, whether that be, you know, most women are going to get reasonably hungry and things are going to change a fair bit in that yes. last week before you get your period. Are you going to take a diet break then when your metabolic rate is slightly higher and you're often very hungry? Probably not. Yep. You, you would agree? Well, yeah. Well, actually I do. I think, I think, you know, obviously every, every person is different. Some people yeah. feel fine. Exactly. Some women are in just freaks case, and they don't, they don't have any yeah. issues. Yeah. yeah. Like in which case you can just keep going as usual. Mm. Don't change the plan. Mm. But if some people report, they're like, Oh my God, I'm ravenous. I'm feeling exactly. like a bottomless pit. I'm this and that. I'm like, okay, then let's give, I'm going to give you a diet break here for about a week. That way I don't want you to feel like you're white knuckling it because the more you white knuckle it, the more likely you are again to, to binge and to go overboard, which then you're just shooting yourself in the foot. So even though it may be by giving you a diet break, it feels like your progress is stalling. We're thinking of your long-term progress because we're actually, even though you're eating more calories on purpose now, you're still eating less than you probably otherwise would if you just tried to keep your calories low and then binged. So anyway, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah for sure. All right, all of that dieting stuff, that is all been covered. Thanks, Sohi. Now, this is just a couple of little business questions because I have a fair few people that follow me that are sort of looking at diving into business, all these type of things. Now, mistakes that you made early on in your career, list a few and what you did to change things. Business from a business standpoint? Yeah. I would say, well, here's what I did well by accident. I apparently had a very entrepreneurial mindset from the beginning in that I was very willing to take risks. I didn't, I was not a lot, like not, a, not even a little bit afraid to make a mistake. I was very willing to just keep moving forward, try things. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try something else. Immediately pivot, move forward, move forward, move forward. And I never let any mistake really discourage me that much. Um, I would say that... You've kind of answered my second question. My second okay. question, my second question was going to be, what advice do you have for young entrepreneurs oh, yes. and also yes. people that want to dive into business? Because you've effectively said it, you know, and I even say it myself, sometimes you don't know, you know, you don't know where your business is going to go, where mine is yeah, right now. Okay. Compa- yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And where, where I thought I would be where I am now compared to when I started, it's so different. Yeah. Right. So, Agreed. And I think that's, I, that's why, this is why I, I, agree, I disagree with a lot of people who give business advice in that I don't think you need to have a niche per se. Yes. You can have a niche. You don't need to have a niche. Agreed. For example, I think I, I have certain specialties, but there are numerous domains that I cover well. And I, I do that very much intentionally. So if you scroll through my social media feed, you can see, oh, I talk about training. I talk about nutrition. I talk about 
um, psychology. I do all of it. I, I mix it up on purpose. And I go through my feed and I go, what topic have I not covered in a while? Oh, shit. And I have a social media calendar that's color coded by topic. And I'm like, I don't see this color. I don't see enough of this color. It's time to do more of these posts. Um, so anyway, that, that's my approach. I also think you don't need to have a five-year plan. I think you should have, I'm like, I, I, like, I don't know where I'm going to be next year. I don't know. Yeah. But what I do know is my values. I know what's important to me. I know my overarching mission. I want to make a positive impact on um, women all around the world, encourage them to strength train, you know, all those things. That is my mission. As far as exactly how I'm going to accomplish that, that can change over time. Because two years ago, I didn't think I'd necessarily be doing what I'm doing now. I didn't think I'd be doing my PhD and like all these things. Um, so in that regard, I've been very open-minded. But again, since the beginning, my business, my mission, and my core values have remained the same. As far as how that is manifested, has, has evolved over time. And I also think to a degree, you have to do that because you never know how, especially if your business depends on social media, you have to be open-minded to social media evolving over time and you have to be willing to evolve with it to keep up. Like for example, now reels is a new feature on Instagram, which is very similar to TikTok. And it looks like their Instagram is rewarding people who get on reels early by pushing your engagement and getting a lot of views to people who use reels. And if you're not willing to do that, you could be missing out on a really positive feature that could help you get on more people's feeds, things like that. Um, so anyway, what was I talking about? Yeah, oh, yeah, that would be open-minded. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. And the other thing about it is, especially at the moment, considering the coronavirus, COVID-19 situation, you have to be, you have oh to think God. on your feet. Yeah. You have to think you on your feet. You have to pivot. Yes. Don't be so dead set on whatever plan you think you have in your head that when a global pandemic happens, you're like, oh shit, <laughs> I have no plan. Yeah. Now I have to quit. No, you don't quit. You pivot. Yeah. And that's, that is, that is probably the most important trait of being a small business owner or, you know, any, any kind of entrepreneur is you have to be willing to pivot and you have to be willing to be like, shit, that didn't work. Even though I invested so much time and energy and money into this Avenue, that is a dead end. That's okay. We have to pivot and just keep moving forward. Just keep trying things. Um, and I, the, you know, over the years, for example, looking back on who was, well-known in the industry 10 years ago, eight years ago, who was making a very positive impact on people. Back then, very different group now. And there are a few select people who have stayed consistent over the past 10 years, but most of them have dropped off. And from my observation, a big part of that is they stopped being consistent. You have to be consistent with creating content, with showing up, um, and again, if, if your business depends on social media, you have to be continually showing up on people's feeds. Otherwise, people forget about you so fast. And that's another big thing for me anyway. I think, another, I think another mistake people make is thinking that they need to achieve a certain thing or a certain goal by the age of 30 or 35. Oh, and right. I, on the first to admit, I made that mistake. I thought I would be somewhere at 28 and then I would be here at yeah, 30. And right. then at 35, right. I'll be here. But I completely agree. You definitely need to pivot and your you know, you, you need to think on your feet, especially in this time. Like the last six months have been the weirdest six months I've had in business yeah. and I've just made things work. I've had to, you just got to kind of just think on your feet, yes. change things yes. up, be adaptable. It's so important and being able to change things up because even the social media platform, you know, like with the algorithm now and everything, everything's just so different than it used to be back in the day. It used to be chronological and now it's algorithm based and, Yep. Like, There's so mean, much we can't control. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And you need to accept and, that. Right. And I think it's, it's not, it's a waste of your resources, your mental resources to get upset over things like that. But instead focusing on how can you show up for other people? How can you uh, keep making money for your business, promote your products and services, without selling yourself out, which again is another big one for me. Um, don't be a sellout, which is completely possible. It is harder. Granted, it is definitely harder, uh, but it is possible. 
And how can you make yourself stand out in a highly saturated industry? And for me, it's, it's very simple. Be consistent as fuck. <laughs> hmm. um, I post almost every single day on Instagram. I, you know, I'm very, very present, very, very visible. I'm basically on my stories almost every single day as well. Um, and it's not just posting, it's posting valuable content. It's posting educational content because that's what my brand is about. And that's what my business specifically um, is about is providing value. So value-based programs, value-based, you know, all those things, which may not be the case for everyone with a trying to build a fitness business, which is fine. Uh, but it is for me. Th- thus, that's what my focus is. And um, being very consistent, I pay attention to what works. I pay attention to what doesn't work. I pay attention to what gets me excited, what I enjoy doing, because I, I'm a huge proponent of if you don't enjoy what it is that you're doing, similar to your nutrition program, if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're not going to stick to it for long. And you're not going to put in your best effort. But I'm, I'm so, I'm almost that way to an extreme to, I've been this way my whole life where if something doesn't interest me, it is so difficult. It's like pulling teeth for me to even like give it half effort, um, which can be good or good and bad. Right. So I, I, that depending on what I enjoy doing, that'll then affect what services I offer, what products I make uh, and what interests me. Um, so pay attention to that pay attention to what is happening on social media, what new features are popping up and so forth. And again, don't be afraid to pivot. Don't be afraid to evolve. For sure. And one other thing, there's so many businesses out there that actually don't have Instagram and they don't have social media and are doing really, really well. And you don't necessarily need social media to do very well, but it is a very good tool and it's free marketing in a way. So I think it's kind of a no brainer for most businesses to at least delve into it. I I think think in this day and age, it would be smart to have some degree of social media. Agreed. Obviously, you know, and, you know, being a good trainer is, is very different from being a good social media <laughs> influencer. They're two different skill sets completely. And being good at social media doesn't mean anything. You can still be a shit trainer, right? You can still be shit at writing nutrition programs and so on. So they are very different skill sets. But if you're good at both of them, it can only help you. And especially if you're trying to run an online business, that does rely to some degree on social media, you should have some kind of presence on the main platforms, Facebook, Instagram, have a website eventually, um, maybe Twitter, uh, again, depending on what you want to do. And again, that's going to evolve. A lot of people jump on Instagram, they start their Instagram account and they have no idea what they're doing. E.g. I had no idea. And then over time, things evolve. And what you were doing three years ago, you look back on and think, oh my God, what was I thinking? You know, that video. Well, I would not post that on my feed. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It wasn't even necessarily the quality of the information, but the quality of the post or the photo or the video or whatever it was. And you're just like, well, now things are just so much... um, more streamlined and everything's kind of pushing towards a similar goal. Right. Um, And I also noticed, I noticed lately too, that when people want to check out a business, people don't really go to their website anymore. They go to your Instagram. Yes. And they look at when was your latest post? How recent, like if you posted three months ago, I'm like, this business is not really staying on top of their stuff. How recent was their post? Do they have any stories I could, I could pop through? Um, what is the actual content that they're posting about? These are the things that I pay attention to. And so definitely you want to be very, very frequent, very, very visible. Again, again, don't have to post seven days a week, but even if it's like two days a week or three days a week, some level of consistency has to be there. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I, I try and do it probably four to five a week, but I always have That's a break. That's really solid. Yeah. Always have a break on the weekend. Yeah. Um, but you got to stay true to the business to stay true to yourself as well Absolutely. and not be a sellout. Absolutely. I completely agree with that because yeah. it's so easy to, you know, go for so that quick easy. buck. So easy in this, in this fitness world to go for the quick buck rather than, you know, taking, playing the long game and realizing that your time is valuable and you've got a lot of, a lot of things to offer to people. And all you're trying to do as a fitness professional at the end of the day is to help people. That's why yeah. I got into it. And by yeah. the sounds of it, it's exactly why you got into it as well. So yeah. I think it's... I love it's, what I do. Yeah. And you can tell you're passionate. Hence why we've talked yeah. for, you know, what's that? It's nearly 70 minutes, I think. <laughs> oh, the other thing I will say, speaking of being passionate, it's okay 
to, so here's what I see happening a lot too, is um, I don't know how to get this per post perfect, so I'm not going to post it. And I'm like, who cares? Just post yeah. it and post it again in three months, redo it, make it a little bit better, post, it this, post the same topic again in three months. So like sometimes I'm like, oh, the lighting here is not quite how, just post it. Because a lot of times people aren't sitting there critiquing exactly how you delivered some message. They care about the actual message. Exactly. Right? So stuff like that. I'm like, sometimes I've, I mean, I even put up and this, I like makes me cringe so hard, but they have been times when I've published an infographic and there's a typo in the infographic, but I'm oh like, Oh my God, I hate that too. <laughs> yeah. Or like, Oh my God, it's not centered. Fuck. Yeah. Um, oh no. but I'm like, you know what? They can still make out what I'm saying. It doesn't change the message. I'm just going to leave it up. And like, it sucks, but maybe in three or four months I can repost it, fix that mistake, move on. Um, so yeah, be okay with, with making mistakes, not being perfect, just be good enough and keep going. It's like with anything, you know, Michael Jordan yeah. said it before about, you know, he, he was given the missing the final shot 26 times and he's missed it 26 times over his career or whatever. You've got to fail to succeed. Um, right. And actually Shona actually posted his quote the other night or something. I on, saw it yesterday yeah, did you on see her that? story. Yeah. Yeah, she posted it. I put it on my it. webinar that I gave last month to the exact same quote. <laughs> yeah, it's a ripping quote. It's pretty much the nuts and bolts for the, the listeners. You've got to fail to end up succeeding. Because you, yeah, you can't. I failed this many times and that's exactly. how I have succeeded, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with failing. you just got to give it a try. And you're always going to fail if you're trying something, especially in business. Like Failure, yeah. failure is the best way to learn. Yes, because you don't forget. Best way to learn. You don't forget a failure. Exactly. Do you? painful yeah <laughs> yeah thanks for coming on sohi it's been a lot of yeah, fun of and you're a wealth of knowledge and a lot of people will get so much out of this so thank you thank you i We're... really enjoyed this great question thank you right thank alley. you <laughs> I, I knew you would enjoy it it's great to chat yeah. as well because obviously you've been out and about for six months and you're back in the states busy, now but yeah finally back for a bit <laughs> where can everyone find you in terms of Instagram, yes. website, all that stuff. Okay. All my platforms are very easy. So he fit across everything. So he fit.com, my Instagram, so he fit, Twitter, so he fit, Facebook, so he fit. And um, there's also a contact form through my website. You can, you can, you to contact me if you need to get a hold of me as well. Brilliant. And for the listeners, so he spelled S O H E E. Yes. It'll yes. be in the show notes and all that. Um, this podcast is live on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and I didn't even realize, but it's on Google Podcasts. Um, any final words, Sohi? Advice? Um, wear your mask, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Great advice. <laughs> yeah. And don't be a prick. <laughs> yeah. Good life advice. <laughs> yeah, great life advice. On that note, stay strong.